Warning. Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat involves the discussion of horror and suspense movies. These movies often include violent, frightening, and disturbing content. Also, we sometimes discuss ladies and their lovely physical attributes, and we sometimes discuss topics considered naughty to talk about in polite company. This program is intended for audiences over the age of 18. Viewer, discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to the Season 2 premiere of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. My name is Carl, I'm the guy that operates the camera, and I am also the head writer for this show. Which means, among other things, that I am responsible for running the production meetings that go on behind the scenes. Now, before we get going with tonight's episode, Mother Taylor Mort suggested that we start doing some behind-the-scenes stuff for all of you every week. So I'm going to quickly uh, make a pass around the Steve the Cat headquarters, and we are going to check in with the various members of the cast behind the scenes. Of course, you all know Steve the Cat. He is the fearless host of our program and our creator. Um, he's still nursing a little bit of a paddleboarding injury from vacation, so he's spending some time on the heating pad while he works on his notes. Steve has uh, gotten over his camera shyness and is going to be doing a better job of hosting the show this year. And of course, over here, hard at work, we have Guinevere, who is Steve's animatronic stunt double because the fine folks at the ASPCA will not let you throw a cat off of the roof no matter how many letters you write, apparently. But actually, we don't do that many stunts on Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. So Guinevere is also a production assistant on the show, and she will be hosting a new segment later this season called Gwen's History Lesson. And over here, Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus, professor of monsterology with a specialty in kaiju studies. He is the host of our Monster Chat segment, where you can get wildly inaccurate information about monsters. Your insults are quite hurtful. Doesn't mean I'm wrong, though. And here we have our craft services area, featuring not one, but two different flavors of cracker, because nothing is too good for our team. Except, of course, for Nutter Butters, because those things are just too pricey. And this, of course, is Fancy the animatronic. Now, Fancy does not have an on-camera role on the show so far. Fancy is our associate producer, which means he handles a lot of the budgeting and scheduling issues for the show. Such as, for example, Fancy paid the caterer. Rest assured that the caterer has been taken care of. Um, hold on, back up. You paid the caterer, right? I have handled the caterer. Fancy, did you murder the caterer? No! You specifically told me not to do that. Fancy... If I look in the utility closet, am I going to find the caterer tied up in there? You'll need to turn the lights on. It's pretty dark in there. Did I not tell you to stop doing that? You told me to stop hitting people over the head and restraining them. So this time, I used chloroform. You're right. That's on me. That's my fault. Okay, I'm going to go take care of that. Let's get the opening credits going. Hello and welcome to the season two premiere of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. I am your host, Steve the Cat. So if you're new to the show, you may be wondering, what is Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat? Well, it's a show dedicated to an entertaining and humorous discussion of horror movies. There's a lot more to horror movies than just guys running around with chainsaws. There's a whole world out there with many different styles of horror movies, and at any moment in time, you have thousands of them available to you just from free streaming services alone. If you're not careful, it can become overwhelming. That's where Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat comes in. Whether you're a longtime fan or brand new to the world of horror, we help you sort through the jungle of movies on streaming services to find things that are worth watching. We had a lot of fun last season, and season two is going to be even better. So let's get started. Tonight, we're going to open the new season by doing something a little different. 
We're going to talk about a couple of Godzilla movies. There have been a lot of Godzilla movies over the years, and they've told a lot of different stories. Sometimes he's the savior, sometimes he's the villain, sometimes he's scary, sometimes he's funny. Well, tonight we've picked two movies from two different eras, but both of them tell a scary story where Godzilla is the villain. I recommend them both, and I think you'll enjoy them. So let's get to it. Thank you so much for joining us. Now here we go. Grab your pencils and your notebooks. It's time for Steve's Vocabulary Lesson. All right, let's get into Season 2 with our first vocabulary lesson of the new season. This is the part of the show where we invent new and exciting words and phrases in an effort to stay ahead of social media bots and algorithms that would otherwise try to ban us. Things are going to be a little different. Not only is this our first vocabulary lesson of the new season, this is our first ever vocabulary lesson for kaiju movies. So this is the first time around doing movies with giant monsters. So the terminology might be a little different from what we've done historically. But here we go. Word number one, bosom augering. This is a noun referring to the action of drilling or boring a hole in the abdomen, thorax, or sternum of a character. And yes, I understand saying abdomen and thorax and sternum is a little bit redundant, but it just sounds so much more scientifical with three words instead of two. So we're gonna go with it. Next word, kabooman clonking. Yes, another German word. This is a noun that refers to the action of dropping a projectile or explosive device directly onto a kaiju's back or noggin from a great height. Now, last season we talked about digging clonking, where somebody gets hit on the head by a shovel. Digging clonking has a long comedic pedigree, resulting in humorous antics and sometimes memory loss. Kaboom and clonking doesn't really have the same comic pedigree, but it is something that happens from time to time in a kaiju movie. Next word, disco balling. Nope, not what you think it is. This refers to the action of rotating a kaiju around its vertical axis while it spews fire, lasers, electricity, atomic breath, or other energy-based projectiles, thus vaporizing or incinerating the surrounding cityscape, and, as an addendum, making it very, very difficult for the poor movie critic who's trying to keep score on how many buildings are getting destroyed. And our last word for today, infouchination. This is a noun that refers to the action whereby a military officer in a monster movie or creature feature cedes control of the armed forces to a scientist in a lab coat. And this is something that happened in 1950s monster movies, particularly all the time. Uh, gee, Dr. Forrester, we really don't know what to do here. Please tell us what to do. It became a little less common as time went on, but it still happens from time to time. Now, interesting thing in uh, Godzilla movies particularly, the scientist who ends up taking control of the armed forces often is kind of an oddball or a screw-up or a, a guy who has spent his lifetime just chasing Godzilla around with a car and a little bit of homemade equipment but turns out to know more than everybody else. But the principle is the same. Anyway, that's Steve's vocabulary lesson for this week. Please keep these terms in mind. They will become important later in the episode. Before we get to our featured film reviews, please enjoy this episode of Monster Chat. Hello, and welcome to Monster Chat. I am your host, Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus. Today we will take a closer look at the creation of the Godzilla movies. It is a widely held belief that Godzilla movies are created using a series of stunt actors who wear large rubber monster costumes. This belief is incorrect. In reality, Godzilla has been portrayed by a large number of otherwise anonymous kaijus. The idea that Godzilla is an actor in a rubber suit was fabricated in an effort to avoid difficulties with the Japanese Stunt Actors Union, 
while avoiding budgetary concerns. In the film All Out Monster Attack, the role of Godzilla was portrayed by a kaiju named Herbert Wilkins. Herbert originally was born in Lincoln, Nebraska, but migrated to Osaka as a youth in search of fame and fortune. Herbert landed employment working as an extra on the first season of Ultraman, but ultimately was dismissed after an ill-advised affair with the makeup director came to a disastrous end. Finding himself blacklisted by the television industry, Herbert found work as the bassist for Bengali Swing, a fusion band that blended jazz standards with traditional Indian folk songs. It was at this time that, Herbert first sampled the combination of Moon Pies and RC Cola. Although simply fattening for humans, this combination has an intoxicating effect upon kaiju physiology. Thus began Herbert's lifelong struggle with addiction. While on tour with Bengali Swing, Herbert met actor Raymond Burr while performing at the opening of Osaka's first big boy restaurant. This led to the highlight of his career playing the role of Godzilla in the film Mall Out Monster Attack. Although critics praised the subtlety and depth of emotion in his performance, his struggles with Moon Pie addiction led to violent outbursts and conflict with his co-stars. After a particularly embarrassing outburst at the film's red carpet opening in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Herbert was dismissed by the head of the studio. His career now, at an end. Herbert currently resides under a bridge near New Orleans. What little income he earns by performing at birthday parties is spent on Moon Pies and RC Cola. Efforts at intervention by his friends and former bandmates have been unsuccessful. This has been Monster Chat with Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus. Thank you for joining me. And now it's time for our Featured Film Reviews. Our first Featured Film Review for today is the movie Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah Giant Monsters All Out Attack. And there you see the poster right there. That title is quite the mouthful. This is a kaiju giant monster movie, a traditional one, as we'll talk about in a minute. It was released in the year 2001. And it was directed by Deep Breath Steve, Shusuke Kaneko, and the cast includes Chiharu Niyama and Ryudu Uzaki. And I apologize, I am sure I mispronounced one or more of those names. It's not intentional. Believe me, folks, I'm a cat. The fact that I speak at all should, should impress you. Let's talk about setting your expectations for this film. So what you should expect going in is a traditional kaiju battle film that casts Godzilla in the villain's role. So this is not a film where Godzilla is the savior of mankind. In this film there is no disputing the fact that Godzilla is the bad guy. Why you should watch this one as opposed to a different Godzilla movie? Well, as traditional rubber suit kaiju movies go, this one is pretty good. This one has I would say better production values than many, a more coherent story. It's easier for maybe a non-Godzilla fan to get into than some of the more uh, over-the-top films like, for example, Godzilla Final Wars. Uh, if you like Pacific Rim, you might like this film. Uh, if you like any traditional Godzilla movie, you might like this film. Let's talk about calibrating your expectations a bit. Now here's our traditional scale. We're on the far left. We have very campy movies that aren't necessarily bad, but you want to go into them with the mindset that this movie is silly and I'm just uh, going in to have fun. On the far right, movies like Silence of the Lambs that are very serious and you go in to think about serious themes and think serious thoughts. Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters, All Out Attack. Uh, it's about as far to the right as you can go, but it's still pretty far to the left. It is left of the midpoint just because it is a movie done with guys in giant rubber suits pretending to be giant monsters, knocking down model cities. Uh, it has its fair share of uh, campy overacting from the Japanese supporting characters screaming, hey, it is Godzilla! So it's not a real serious film, but it is not nearly as ridiculous as some of the Godzilla films, uh, particularly from the 70s. Let's do a quick summary of this film. It is a traditional kaiju battle movie that pits an evil Godzilla 
against a trio of guardian monsters, Baragon, Mothra, and King Ghidorah. It follows the original Gojira and, interestingly, also the 1998 American film Godzilla, the awful one with Matthew Broderick. So the continuity of this film is that the original Godzilla movie of 1954 happened, and then a few years ago, a creature that may or may not have been Godzilla showed up and attacked New York. That's obviously a reference to the 1998 American film. Although in this film, they, they are not conclusively sure whether that was Godzilla or something else that was similar to. And then we have this film. So uh, they set up a continuity where uh, all those movies where Godzilla saves Earth from aliens or saves Earth from other monsters never happened. And this is just purely... Uh, in a universe where Godzilla shows up and bad things happen because he's the villain. The film follows the lives of Yuri, a journalist for a low-rep producer of docudramas, think a reality TV producer, and her father Taiso, who is an admiral in the Japanese Self-Defense Force, and once again I apologize for mispronouncing these names, I feel terrible about it. A mysterious old man finds Yuri while she is on an assignment and explains to her that Godzilla is going to return and that the Guardian monsters must be summoned to stop him. And then the film follows the combined efforts of the Guardian monsters and the Japanese Self-Defense Force to stop Godzilla with Yuri chronicling the events. This is an above average movie and it is more coherent than many Godzilla films. Now that, that's not to say that this is the most coherent movie you've ever watched, but it is easier to follow than a lot of the traditional Japanese films. And, and I guess I should mention, it kind of seems silly to even have to mention this, but this film is in Japanese with English subtitles. There may be a dubbed version of it out there somewhere. I honestly, I didn't even look at the bonus features on my DVD copy to see if uh, American dubbing is available because I just prefer to watch Godzilla movies in Japanese with English subtitles. Um, so be aware of that going in, and for some people that automatically makes the movie a, a tad more difficult to follow, but that's kind of the price of admission when you're watching a Godzilla film. Things Steve liked about this film. Well, first of all, it provides a brief bit of exposition at the beginning to ground you in the movie's continuity. So uh, like I mentioned, it tells you right up front which films are and are not part of the continuity. Uh, it gives a good balance between old-school rubber monster suit campiness and a serious story. There are two likable lead characters. There is plenty of kaiju battle action. Uh, interesting point about this film, you know, the original Godzilla is in many ways an allegory about atomic weapons and their use on Japan. In this film, Instead of taking Godzilla as an allegory for the atomic bomb, in this film, Godzilla, you know, for lack of a better word, represents all of Japan's sins from the Imperial and pre-World War II and World War II era coming home to roost. Um, the old man explains that Godzilla is basically a receptacle or a vessel for the souls of all the people who died in the Pacific conflict and he's asked early in the movie, he's like, well, why would all these Japanese soldiers attack the homeland? And it's explained to him, it's like, well, yeah, but for all the Japanese soldiers that were that died, many, many more civilians from other nations were lost. And so they're just outnumbered. And I just found it interesting to see uh, a Japanese film, instead of uh, casting Japan in the victim's role, to take some sort of responsibility for the uh, actions of the imperial government from uh, the time leading up to and in World War II, because if you know anything about world history, there is little, if any, territory in that part of the world that Japan did not attack in the 1920s and 30s. In this film, there is no question that Godzilla is a villain, not a savior. He does some pretty horrible things. And there are some nice Easter egg references to classic kaiju films without going overboard. Things that could have been better, well, right up front. It has more than its share of traditional Japanese kaiju movie campiness. There are some characters that are intentionally silly. You have plenty of people going, hey, Godzilla, and overacting. Um, it, that's just par for the course. You have to just kind of bake that in. There is a lot of intentional overacting by some of the supporting characters, not the leads, but uh, 
one of one of the guys who's like an on-screen broadcaster for this documentary company is just way over the top. The guy that plays the head of the news network is kind of over the top. It's it's comic relief. They're written that way. Since the film was created using stuntmen in rubber costumes, the fight sequences involve lots of bumping into each other and grappling. It doesn't have nearly the kinetic excitement of something like the recent Godzilla vs. Kong, so uh, it, it's, it's a lot of pushing and shoving and bumping into each other. You don't have people, you know, or excuse me, you don't have kaijus climbing buildings and jumping off of them uh, and lots of kinetic action like you've had, say, in the new Godzilla vs. Kong movie. But that's, that's just a matter of... Um, that's just a matter of reality with the fact that you've got a movie that was done by stuntmen in rubber suits. The story is fairly predictable. Uh, let's get to Steve's final scorecard for Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters, All Out Attack. Now, obviously, we've had to use a revised scoring system for this since it's a kaiju movie, so we're not going to do the traditional metrics we normally track with a movie like this. Kaiju KOs. Five. Yes, five, even though there's only four monsters, because King Ghidorah gets knocked out twice. Boozamogerings. I've said seven estimated. Now, nobody ever won an Academy Award for being the continuity director for a Japanese kaiju movie. Um, basically, you have one person do the special effects shot of aircraft or ships firing missiles. Then you have somebody else doing the special effects shot of a bunch of little flash pots going on on the outside of the rubber monster costume. And those two people never talk to each other. So the number of missiles you see getting launched never bears any resemblance to the number of explosions you see on the kaiju's body. Um, if you do, it's completely coincidence. So because of that, it's really difficult to get an accurate count. So I've estimated seven. Kaboom and Clonking's kind of the same problem. I've estimated 10. City Wards destroyed one, and it's done really interestingly. You see Godzilla kind of winding up and taking an inhale, and you know he's about to use the atomic breath, but then instead of showing him use the atomic breath and destroy the town, it cuts away to a bunch of school children in a classroom and their teacher telling them to get ready to do a disaster drill and they all turn their head and look out the window and just see a giant mushroom cloud where this city ward used to be. Buildings destroyed. I've said 12 plus many more. So the way we score buildings destroyed is that you get up close and personal one-on-one -on -one views of 12 buildings being destroyed and that does not count the many more that happen when say for example that city ward gets destroyed or, uh, or Godzilla is just walking and shuffling his feet and you see little tiny houses going flying everywhere, but you get an up close and personal view of 12 buildings getting crushed. Bridges and tunnels, two. It's actually one of each, one bridge, one tunnel. Tanks and artillery, I have estimated 15. I know it's a lot and they give a real quick glimpse of like a monitor in uh, headquarters uh, for the army and uh, you see a graphic representing like one group of what looks like nine pieces of artillery and another representing what looks like six pieces of artillery and they all disappear. So from that I'm estimating that it was 15, may have been more, it's really difficult to say it goes by very quickly. Helicopters! One, and it's a news helicopter, not an army helicopter. Fixed wing aircraft! Four. Naval warships, one, plus one is seriously damaged. So I was tempted to say one and a half, but I thought about it. Naval ships are designed to be damaged and keep fighting, and this ship does keep fighting, so I did not count it. So I just count the one that was destroyed. And other ships and submarines, three. But with your viewing of Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters, All Out Attack, you also get some bonus features such as a zany news organization chief. You get attempted dog drowning. Yes, uh, going back to Zombievers from last season, uh, once again, somebody who decided, boy, this dog is annoying, let's put it in a box, take it out in a boat, and drown it. Because apparently that's something people really do. You get a Suicide Forest reference, uh, and, and it's kind of interesting. They, they never really hit you in the face and explain to you exactly what's happening, but in one scene you have a businessman who is out in a forest, and he is uh, standing on top of a rock so he can reach a tree branch, and he is looping his necktie over it and testing the branch to test its strength. He's obviously about to hang himself, and then, of course, the ground collapses under his feet. He falls into a secret cavern, and that's where King Ghidorah has been resting for all of these years. And at that point, he decides, 
you know, screw killing myself, I got to go tell somebody about this. But it's just interesting that uh, they put such a matter of fact reference to somebody killing himself in a forest in this movie. And if, if you don't know anything about Japan and Japanese culture, you don't get that. You get a good argument for home health care because Godzilla just flattened the hospital. You get a classic Gojira reference. Uh, you get Godzilla peering over the mountaintop, just like in the original film. You get a classic Mothra reference when he does a flyby, two sisters turn their heads, and it's obviously a reference to the two twins who are in all of the Mothra films. You get Baragon Baseball. Uh, yeah, you'll understand what that means. You get Ghidorah Sushi for everyone. Boy, you get a big chunky mess at the end of his stint in this movie. And finally, you get Godzilla Springs, an atomic leak. So, Steve's final score for this film. We're going to give it two and a half paws out of four. We're going to say this is an above-average kaiju movie made in the traditional style with rubber suits and model cities as opposed to computer graphics. It features a likable cast and a story that is more coherent than many Godzilla films. So... If Godzilla films are not for you, this one's probably not going to change your mind, but if you're kind of on the fence, you might enjoy this one. If you're a fan of Godzilla films, you will obviously enjoy this one. So I've kind of averaged all that out together and given this one two and a half paws out of four. I like this movie. I'm a big Godzilla fan, so I recommend it. Uh, I recommend that even if you're on the fence, you give it a try, because like I said, this one's more coherent than a lot of the older Godzilla films. So two and a half paws out of four. Uh, recommendation for Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters, All Out Attack. So that's our first featured film review for today. And now a word from our benevolent overlords at PBDC-TV, your nightly heartbeat of horror. This is Mikey from Out of the Ordinary, and you're watching PBDC-TV.
Oh, hi. First thing in the morning, when I'm listening to music and getting a little bit of time for some creepy research, I'm always representing with my PBDC merch. What a better way to have a cup of coffee in the morning. Don't forget to check out our other cool merch at RootsBleedRed.com. That's RootsBleedRed.com. This is Professor Edgar Fluffosaurus from Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat, and when I'm not hosting Monster Chat or knocking down small Japanese cities, I'm watching PBDC TV. Now back to the show. Let's get into our second featured film review for this episode. We're going to talk about the 2016 film Shin Godzilla. And there is the poster, and that is just a gorgeous poster. It's just so overpowering in its simplicity. It's just a great poster. Uh, this is, of course, a kaiju movie, or if you prefer, a giant monster movie, with a horror twist to it. It was released in the year 2016. It was directed by, deep breath Steve, deep breath, Hideki Anno and Shinji Higuchi. And the cast includes Hiroki Hasegawa, Yutaka Takanachi, and the very lovely Satomi Ishihara. And as always, my apologies for what I'm sure was mispronunciation of at least some of those names. So let's talk about setting your expectations for this film. I liked this film a lot, so let's get your expectations calibrated. If you go into this movie, what you should expect is a standalone, self-contained Godzilla origin story told from a horror movie perspective rather than a campy perspective or action movie perspective. And be aware that this is a Japanese film with English subtitles. I am not aware whether a dubbed version is even available. I don't like to watch dubbed versions of uh, Godzilla movies in the first place, so... I own this movie on Blu-ray. I've not looked to see if English dubbing is even an option. Um, but, you know, if if you can't watch a Japanese movie with English subtitles, then Godzilla movies aren't for you. Why you should watch is this is a different take on Godzilla. It is a terrific ensemble drama that manages to give a different feel to the traditional kaiju movie. It's still a Godzilla movie, but they go about telling the story a different way. If uh, you like Cloverfield or Pacific Rim, you might like this movie, but I have also thrown into the you might also like list movies like Midway, and that could be either the 1970s version or the recent remake, and The Longest Day, uh, old war movies, or any Godzilla film. We'll talk in a few minutes about why I have included movies like Midway and The Longest Day in this list. Let's talk about uh, calibrating your expectations a little bit. Here's the scale we like to use. Very campy movies on the far left, movies that you uh, enjoy because you go in to have fun laughing laughing with them or laughing at them. Movies on the far right, very serious, make you think about deep thoughts. Shin Godzilla is about as far to the right as a Godzilla movie can go. Uh, there's obviously a lot of suspension of disbelief in any kind of kaiju movie, and that's going to keep it from making its way all the way to the far right of the scale, but this is not a movie where you play drinking games and do shots every time Godzilla kicks down a building or knocks down an airplane. Uh, this is actually a movie that you go and root for the humans. So let's get to a film summary. So there's the poster again. And as we said, this is a self-contained, standalone Godzilla origin story with no connection to any other Godzilla film or any other film of any kind for that matter. The film opens with the Japanese Coast Guard investigating a yacht found adrift in the harbor, apparently abandoned except for a manila envelope, a file of scientific data with a cryptic message written on the front. As the Coast Guard are investigating the yacht, a disturbance appears in the water which damages the traffic tunnels that run under the harbor. So much like we have here, say around Baltimore, you've got traffic tunnels that run under the water and those are damaged and partly flooded uh, as the result of something. Soon after this happens, as the government's trying to figure out how to respond, a gigantic creature comes staggering ashore, crashing into buildings and destroying the things in its path. And then, 
As time goes on, the creature mutates several times, each time becoming larger, more dangerous, and more destructive. And I will tell you right now, Godzilla does not look like Godzilla at the beginning of this movie, but by the end he certainly does. So kind of think of the original iteration of Alien, where the alien is terrifying, but he looks completely different at the beginning of his life cycle than at his end. This film follows an ensemble of government ministers, scientists, and military officers who must devise a way to combat the creature while navigating the treacherous waters of international politics, just like one would have to do in real life. This film has a serious horror movie tone. It is not a campy 70s Godzilla film. Let's talk about the villain profile. Our villain, of course, is Gojira. And there's a close-up on his face from Shin Godzilla. And understand this villain profile is only applicable to the movie Shin Godzilla. We're not attempting to provide a villain profile that amalgamates every iteration of Godzilla from movies and anime and everything else. He belongs to the kaiju class. I've said giant lizard. I am sure people are going to get up in arms and wave their arms and say Godzilla's not a lizard. Yes, I know Godzilla's not a lizard. He bears the closest resemblance to a lizard. Um, if you understand what's going on in this movie, you would say he probably defies categorization in our traditional structure of genus and phylum and species and everything else. But, you know, I mean, obviously he has gills and lizards don't have gills. But uh, at the same time, physically, the thing he resembles most is a giant lizard. Special powers. Uh, kind of hard to describe. Gojira is quite literally the most highly evolved creature on the planet Earth with the ability to generate nuclear energy to power itself as a food source and to mutate and evolve as necessary to adapt to his surroundings and also, by the way, has atomic breath. Signature weapon, atomic breath. Signature technique, disco balling while using his atomic breath, laying waste to entire city wards in one fell swoop. Let's talk about the things Steve liked about this movie. Just a few of the things Steve liked about this movie because we could go on all day about what we liked about this movie. There is a terrific ensemble cast and of all the Godzilla films, this one may do the best job of making the humans the center of the film and yet actually making an interesting movie. Uh, the movie is far more about the people than the monster and yet it's interesting anyway. It vaguely feels like an old war movie or the disaster films of the 1970s where large ensemble casts told several interlocking stories with one massive overall event. And that's why I mentioned movies such as Midway or The Longest Day. Uh, if you're familiar with either of those movies, it gets into the Battle of Midway or the Normandy invasion, but it's not all an action movie. There's a lot leading up to the action in terms of planning and uh, put it, putting together what's going to happen and contingencies and there's just a lot of different intersecting stories all leading up to this massive event. The film has a horror movie feel not an action movie feel and this iteration of Godzilla is visually terrifying. You got kind of a glimpse of that on the previous slide. There are good special effects. This is not a rubber monster or a guy in a rubber suit kicking over model buildings. These are actually computer-generated special effects. Now, uh, on the other hand, this is not a Marvel Cinematic Universe $300 million budget movie. So the CGI special effects are good. They're probably not quite as elite as you would get in something like Avengers Endgame, but they're still very good. This movie attempts to realistically address the political and bureaucratic realities that come with a natural disaster. And you will root for the humans to succeed. This little ragtag team of bureaucrats who's trying to figure out a way to stop Godzilla, you're actually going to like them, you're actually going to root for them to succeed. Like I said, this is not one of those movies where you play a drinking game and, and you cheer every time Godzilla kicks a building over. Uh, when Godzilla winds up to use his atomic breath and you know he's going to take out an entire city block, you don't cheer, you kind of sit back and say, oh no, oh no. Talk about things that could have been better. Some may find the ensemble feel confusing or feel that there are too many different characters. Uh, now, in part, the movie helps you out there by doing a similar thing to what was done, uh, once again, in movies like Midway or The Longest Yard, in that every time a character appears on screen, 
they quickly throw up a subtitle to tell you the character's name and rank and basically the role they play in everything. And they, they do that throughout the film, not just at the very beginning. Very much like if you watch The Longest Day or Midway, and that is helpful. So I don't think this will be too big a problem for you, but be aware that there are a lot of moving parts in this movie. Some may think too much of the film centers on governmental meetings and other bureaucratic events. That's a fair criticism. In part, um, you know, the director of this movie uh, always tries to leave his themes a little bit wide open for interpretation. Some have argued that this film was um, intended to kind of poke the finger at the Japanese government's uh, entrenched bureaucracy and their inability to react quickly to the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster back in 2011. You could get some of that. Um, having worked myself in large organizations for much of my career, I can tell you that a lot of what goes on in this is realistic and frankly it's just the price for living in a representative de democratic kind of society where you can't have one person just take control of everything and do what he or she likes. There are fewer action sequences than you would expect in a giant monster movie and, and I was okay with that, but um, just be aware that this is not lots and lots of battle sequences. Many parts of the film have a found footage feel with obligatory camera bouncing, and I don't mean that as an artistic criticism. It makes perfect sense for what they were doing. But if you're the kind of person who gets motion sick watching found footage movies, be aware of that going in and uh, maybe take a Dramamine ahead of time. Gojira's first iteration is a bit goofy looking, more confusing than frightening. I'm going to guess that was kind of intentional because uh, they were trying to make the point that it, you know, at, at first people aren't really sure what to make of this and exactly what to do. So Gojira's not really frightening at first. I mean, he's frightening in terms of the fact that he's so big and he's crashing into things, but n not scary looking. And, and that changes as the film goes on. Although the bulk of the film is in Japanese, the American characters speak English, but their dialogue sounds like it was written in Japanese and then translated into English so it can sound unnatural to an American ear. And to give you a couple of examples, uh, there's an older politician talking to a younger politician and how he's concerned that events might be a stain on her fastidious career. And that's just not the way Americans talk. We don't say fastidious career. Uh, we don't talk about nuclear weapons as our nuclear wisdom. I'm sure that this is literally true, that the script was probably originally written in Japanese and then translated into English. So it's going to clash with your ear a little bit if you're an American audience. Uh, in fairness, Hollywood has probably done this exact same thing in reverse to Japanese audiences a thousand times over, so I would not get wound up over it. Just be aware that it's going to happen. And finally, no American is going to believe that Satomi Ishihara's character is an American. Uh, the very lovely Satomi Ishihara plays a character in this film where she is a liaison for the United States government to Japan. She is the daughter of an American senator, but her grandmother was a Japanese national. So she's fluent in Japanese and, and thus uniquely positioned to uh, be the bridge between the United States and Japan in this film. But of course, she's actually a Japanese actress and in the some scenes where she does speak English, she's just quite obviously not a native English speaker. And uh, so it's just not that believable. But getting back to what I said before, this is nothing Hollywood has not done to Japanese audiences a thousand times over. So just uh, swallow a little suspension of disbelief and go with it. So Steve's scorecard for Shin Godzilla, we've had to do a very different scorecard for this because it's a giant kaiju movie and not a traditional horror movie. So Kaboom and Clonkings, I counted maybe eight. It's kind of hard to get a, a perfect count, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it eight. Disco Ballings, four, and there are some, <laughs> there are some interesting Disco Ballings in this film. Infalchinatings, none. This movie actually shows how government is supposed to work, and it's not the old 1950s horror movie trope of one scientist taking over the entire armed forces. Trains. Eight trains destroyed in this film. City wards. Five entire wards in the city of Tokyo destroyed by Gojira. Buildings. 17 plus hundreds more, and what I mean by that is that you get up close and personal view of 17 buildings getting destroyed, not counting the ones that get annihilated during the disco ballings, and not counting the fact that every time he walks, 
Godzilla's walking through a residential area and houses are flying much in the same way as if you're walking through a gravel parking lot and shuffling your feet a little bit. Bridges! One. Tanks and trucks, and I have just estimated 23 here. Now, at one point in the movie, Godzilla pulls up a bridge and throws it at the tanks and destroys three tanks. Later in the film, he destroys a whole flotilla of uh, pumper trucks, and I didn't get a real accurate count of those, so I'm just estimating that it was 20 trucks plus the three tanks that were crushed by the bridge. Helicopters, one. Fixed wing aircraft, six plus Five squadrons of Predator drones, a lot of which kind of happens off camera, but they, they send five sorties of drones against uh, Gojira and he destroys all of them. But with your viewing of Shin Godzilla, you also get a few bonus features such as non-committal, indecisive, useless academics who are unwilling to offer any suggestions for fear of being wrong and losing their credibility, just like in real life. You get giant turkey fish thing Gojira. Like I said, that first iteration of Gojira is more bizarre than scary, but that soon changes. You get the new prime minister hates soggy noodles, and who among us doesn't? You get a new spin on disco balling. I don't want to give away a spoiler if you've not seen the movie, but it is really cool. You get meetings, meetings, and more meetings. It is action meetings aplenty in this movie. Uh, it, it supports the story, but, you know, like I said, this is not a action movie. And finally, what is up with Gojira's tail in that final scene? I am not going to spoil this for you, but oh my god. The very final scene of the film, the very final image of the film before the credits roll... Um, if you go to dinner after watching this with friends or go out to drinks afterwards, it'll give you something to discuss for the entire time, just to bat around what you saw, what you think you saw, and what you think it means. So let's get to Steve's final score for Shin Godzilla. We're going to give this three and a half paws out of four. I loved this film. It is an outstanding kaiju movie that manages to offer a fresh take on Godzilla, despite the fact that there have been over 30 other films and animated series, and comic books, and so on and so on. It successfully takes a horror approach rather than a campy one. I recommend this movie highly. It is available on Blu-ray. You might be able to watch this, uh, rent this through Amazon Prime. I am not sure. It might be available through Funimation as well. I am not aware of this movie being available for free on any major streaming service like Netflix for right now, but I do recommend this one highly. So if you run across it in a Redbox machine, or have the opportunity to rent it, or if you just want to buy it outright, I recommend this movie highly. We are almost out of time for this episode, but before we go, let's quickly talk about some other stuff Steve watched this week. Number one, Havenhurst. This is a movie about a young woman with a troubled past who gets out of rehab and takes up residence in a gothic apartment building, basically a kind of halfway house. Mysterious things start to happen, and the woman ultimately must confront an evil presence in the apartment building. Uh, this one's pretty good. It features Julie Benz and a brief appearance by Danielle Harris. It is a pretty good movie. Uh, I would recommend this one. Hollow's Grove is our second film, and in Hollow's Grove, the cast of a ghost hunting TV show spend the evening locked in an abandoned mental hospital that is allegedly haunted. The cast intends to fake some supernatural happenings for their show, but as it turns out, supernatural things soon start happening for real, as often happens in these found footage kind of films. That said, even though it's kind of formulaic, this is above average to pretty good. It's a pretty good implementation of an idea that has been done a million times over. And this one includes a brief appearances by McKelty Williamson and Lance Henriksen, so apparently made by some people with some connections. Pretty good movie. Again, I would cautiously recommend this one. It's it's a found footage film. Uh, it is a found footage film about ghost hunters, and obviously there's a hundred million of those on Amazon Prime, but this one's actually worth watching. Third thing for this week, Godzilla Singular Point. This is a 13 episode 2D animated anime series. So it is Japanese, but it is licensed by Netflix. So I think this is only available on Netflix. I don't know if it's available on anything like Crunchyroll or Funimation. Uh, in this anime, 
various characters are brought together by their investigation of a mysterious radio signal and soon find themselves entangled with the emergence of various giant monsters as well as elements that defy our traditional understanding of physics. It is a very anime series. Uh, if you grew up watching things like uh, Battle of the Planets or Star Blazers or uh, Robotech, anything along that line, or even Speed Racer, this is going to look very familiar to you. And it is a very different take on the Godzilla universe. It is a completely different spin on the Godzilla universe. Uh, that said, I would say it is interesting. It is also a bit confusing. The science, and I use that in quotes, is a bit weird, although I'm going to admit right up front, I am currently re-watching this. I'm going through it a second time, and it makes a lot more sense the second time around. Anyway, I would cautiously recommend this one at well. So two movies that I recommend, one anime that I would cautiously recommend. I mean, you know who you are if you like anime or don't like anime. Uh, but if you are the kind of person who's willing to give anime a try, I would recommend you give Godzilla Singular Point a shot. As far as traditional horror movies go, definitely uh, can recommend Havenhurst and Hollow's Grove. So that is some other stuff Steve watched this week. Well, that brings us to the end of the Season 2 premiere episode of Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show. Now, if you did enjoy the show, please remember to like, share, subscribe, and follow. You can find us on Facebook at Spooky Tales with Steve the Cat. And yes, that's Tales with an A-I-L-S. Also, please remember to check out all of my friends and their great programming on PBDC-TV. Whether you're interested in horror movies, true crime, weird history, or unexplained events, we're sure to have something for you. And don't worry, PBDC TV is easy to find. We're on the World Wide Web at pbdctv.com, and we're on YouTube at PsychoBunnyDC. We've also got a large presence on Facebook. You can find the mothership at PBDC TV, or you can go directly to dedicated pages for different channels, such as Psycho Bunny Death Cult, Psychomandium 13, and Roots Bleed Red. Each channel has a little bit of a different atmosphere, but they're all part of the PBDC TV Collective. Please join us again next week. It's going to be great. We're going to be talking about a couple of classic films from the 1980s based upon stories by H.P. Lovecraft. It's sure to be a lot of fun. In the meantime, thank you once again for joining us. Everyone stay safe and have a great week. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye, everybody.